This episode is brought to you by our incredible community of listener supporters on Patreon. Our Patreon offers listeners exclusive archival content, extended episodes, and access to community conversations diving deeper with past guests. Right now, we are $2,000 away from reaching our $5,000 of listener support each month. Your monthly pledge ensures that For the Wild has the funding to keep producing informative, thoughtful, and rooted conversations and programming. All funding supports our small team of creatives, podcast production, and special For the Wild projects like our zines and slow study courses. To support us on Patreon, please visit patreon.com slash for the wild, or if you would rather make a one-time donation or recurring donation outside of Patreon, please visit for the wild.world slash donate. Hello, and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today, we are speaking with Amy Glenn. Threshold moments can happen throughout a day, walking through the woods and pausing and noticing deeply noticing can feel like a threshold you see into something that's mysterious there's a pause of the regular mind and a recognition of some kind of mystery at work or some kind of liminal space where birth and death meet because a walk through the forest is a walk through birth and death amy wright glenn earned her ma in religion and education from teachers college columbia university She earned her BA from Reed College in the study of religion. Amy taught for 11 years in the religion and philosophy department at the Lawrenceville School in New Jersey, earning the Dunbar Abstin Junior Chair for teaching excellence. She is a birth and death doula, hospital chaplain, Kripalu yoga teacher, and founder of the Institute for the Study of Birth, Breath, and Death. From 2015 to 2020, Amy served as an active contributor to Philly Voice writing on topics relating to birth, death, parenting, and spirituality. Amy is the author of Birth, Breath, and Death, Meditations on Motherhood, Chaplaincy, and Life as a Doula and Holding Space on Loving, Dying, and Letting Go. Amy has trained thousands of professionals in the work of holding space for life's transitions and focuses specifically on grief and bereavement care. To learn more, visit birthbreathanddeath.com. Well, Amy, thank you so much for being on the show today. I'm really looking forward to diving into some of these topics with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, I thought we'd start off with kind of a a window into your world, and I would love to talk through the realities of being a doula and how you found your calling in doula work. Such a wonderful question. And as I've journeyed in life as a doula, I've realized that doulas do so much with transitions, not only birth, but also transitions such as death or big change, supporting people through significant life events. And my pathway to birth doula work really connects to my sister, Rachel, who was pregnant with her first baby. This was 18 years ago. Her daughter just turned 18 and was separating from her husband. It was a hard situation. She came to live with me and asked if I would be her birth partner. And that question brought some fear because I didn't know very much about birth at all. And I thought, oh goodness, I'm going to need some help. So I went to the library at my school. I checked out a bunch of books on birth. The librarian looked at me quizzically like, are you pregnant? (laughs) Because we were friends. I said, oh no, it's not for me, my sister. And I explained and she said, oh, I think you might want to consider hiring a doula. And I'd never heard the word until that moment. And I said, oh, what? What is this? And she explained what birth doulas do. And as soon as the explanation was in the air, I thought, that's what we need. So I checked out all the books. I went home to my sister, Rachel, and I said, Rachel, I just learned about doulas and I want to get one for this birth. And Rachel said, no, I don't think so. Like I have you, I don't need a doula. And then I said, Rachel, I need the doula. (laughs) So that's my story of how I started the path. I did the doula training for birth and then over time became involved in death doula work. And now I help train doulas as well. So it's been such a heartfelt journey. And I really credit the librarian at my school and my amazing sister, Rachel, and of course, her amazing daughter, who's now in college, my niece, Darcy. 
I love that your family brought you into this work. And I think it's really fascinating and in no way a surprise to people that as a culture, it seems like we we have value, of course, for these vital jobs that act in service to humanity, whether that's teaching or making food or tending to the dying. But they're valued much less than jobs that serve capital accumulation in the overculture. And so I wonder what cultural work is needed to recognize the value of these services to humanity and uplift them so they're not always overshadowed by those roles that are about endless growth and consumption and so on and so forth. Oh, goodness. I mean, this goes beyond doula work. For sure, this connects to caregiving in general. The people who care for children, often teachers, you know, just the human caregiving at the end of life, the caregivers who care for parents, who care for partners when they're sick, and how we self-care. Because a culture that's very focused on productivity and consumerism also views its citizens primarily as consumers and not fully embodied, multidimensional human beings who are not only consumers, but also who feel and create and think and cry and get hurt and need care and give care. So what you're asking is really how do we reframe what we value as a culture? How do we reframe where we put our time and how do we see each other in a way that's multidimensional and I think supportive of life's complexity instead of just what business you know you support when you go to the store and what products you buy and what you wear and what you drive you know that that type of thinking really limits our perspectives of each other and of ourselves Mhm yeah In the Institute for the Study of Birth, Breath, and Death, which you founded in 2015, is described as, quote, inspiring and nurturing organization community dedicated to furthering the development and professional skill set of those called to hold space for birthing, living, and dying, end quote. So, yeah, I, I would just love to get more into the weeds here. And I know you started to touch on it in the last few responses, but how does the role of the doula serve to hold all of these spaces? It's a really great question. I think that if we go to the root of the what the word doula means, you know, to support, to serve, and particularly, you know, to serve women in childbirth traditionally in the Greek culture, I think we can find a lot of meaning. When we attend to people and they are opening their bodies literally to life, new life, and sometimes to death, there is such a need for someone to be present, compassionate, courageous, confident, and clear. To hold space, which means to bring compassionate presence to what is. And what is in the moment of birth is deep work. You know, it's a deep powerful exploration of self that happens and unfolds when we enter into labor or enter into an operating room for a cesarean delivery. My sense is that the Institute is one place, and it's one of many good places, where people who are drawn to those transformative moments and who want to serve can come and recharge and learn and dive in. I, I, for instance, just last night, I finished teaching a course called Understanding Trauma for birth and death doulas. And I brought in two mental health professionals whom I admire and respect. We used a a core text by Dr. Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey called What Happened to You. And we divided that book into sections and did group study and discussion, all for the purpose of strengthening the work of doulas. And that involves also self-care because a great deal of that book has to do with our own trauma or our own story and how we self-care for our own nervous system, keep it regulated, stay regulated. So, you know, your question about the role of doulas and and the institute that is created to help support people like doulas, I think it's a great one. And, And I would really love to see more organizations develop where people slow down and digest and consider and reflect and learn together in a multifaceted way, not just intellectually, because we could study the book, but we also pause to meditate. We also pause to move. We pause to breathe. We took the time to deeply listen. 
And those are the skills that really help information sink in. It's not just in the intellectual realm. It goes into the emotional realm and into the body as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, totally agree with you there. And I'm really fascinated in the nature of your work that touches on the thresholds between life and death. And I'm wondering, how do you recognize the salience of these, quote, threshold times while also handling the uncertainty that comes with them? Yeah, well, that's what the saliency is. It's the uncertainty. That's why it's a threshold. It's unknown. It's mysterious. It's hard. It's a place where the normal rules don't apply. You're in a, a liminal space, you know, beyond the regular up, down, sideways, backward, you know, the, the general rules we use to navigate. It's, it's a place without a map in many ways. And so threshold moments, I think, can happen throughout a day, walking through the woods and pausing and noticing deeply noticing can feel like a threshold. You see into something that's mysterious. There's a pause of the regular mind and a recognition of some kind of mystery at work or some kind of liminal space where birth and death meet because a walk through the forest is a walk through birth and death. There's trees being born, trees dying, animals, our own self every moment, every breath in and out is a mini birth and death. So my hope is that we can think more clearly about thresholds, be less afraid of them, be more willing to notice when we're in one and have support. And that's what a doula does. It said, a doula says, I will companion you through your wilderness. I will walk side by side. I can't walk for you and I won't tell you how to do it. I can maybe point out a few boulders that I stumbled on, but really it's about companioning someone else through their meaning making, through their grief, through their birth, through their breath, through their death. And that's what we do. We companion each other. As Ram Das used to say, we, we really are just walking each other home. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's so comforting to hear, especially in an individualistic culture that isolates us and separates us to have somebody with us. And I'm also thinking about how the medical system also really isolates us from connection and care. And it seems that so many of these moments, these threshold moments have been so medicalized and you know, I'm just thinking about how both birth and death are often in isolated hospital rooms away from family or community support. And I, I want to recognize that, yes, medical involvement is sometimes totally needed in these situations, but there is a vital human existential need during these moments that is often ignored. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we navigate these medicalized systems with ourselves, with our loved ones while we know that we are in deep need of connection as to not become more traumatized or to not miss out on these moments that are so vital to our humanity? Well, I really like that question because it makes me think of a dialectic. You know, dialectics are when you have two ideas, they seem like they're in opposition, but when they overlap, you see the wisdom, the wise mind space. So this comes from the work of Marsha Linehan who is the psychologist who developed dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT. And in her work, she said, you know, acceptance seems like it's opposite to the will to change. And on one hand, they are opposite, right? They're in dialectic. But when they overlap, when you have acceptance and change and, and you stand in the middle in that wise mind place, you can see how they both have the elements of truth. So medical models are created by people and people are multidimensional. And even if medicine needs to focus on certain elements, like how much protein is in your urine or what's happening with your heart right now, or what's going on with liver cancer, it focuses on specifics. The person who's focusing is still a person and the person receiving that focus is still a person. So we have on one hand, like a medical model that could separate, isolate, but we also have community models that connect and reinforce multidimensional realities. So when they overlap, I think we can be even in a wiser place, a wise mind place, when we have the best of medicine and the best of human heart connected. You know, my uncle just died in Utah in a hospital, surrounded in a palliative care unit by 
deeply compassionate nurses and a deeply loving family. And now it's not a perfect system, but it's not as if because he didn't die at home, it was somehow isolating. There was a lot of love in that hospital room with him. So there's ways we can reframe and there's ways we can, I think, begin to stand in dialectic with more curiosity rather than try to make it an either or situation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, maybe let's talk about or dissect that either or situation. And we could potentially talk about what it could look like out of the medicalized system, within the medicalized system, both of those scenarios. And then if we were to be in either of them, how could we be a part of setting them up for healing and connection? Yeah, that's the big question. And I'm I'm just beginning to really settle it with some ideas in myself. I mean, I think this takes the best minds in every field. It's a lot of what Dr. Bruce Perry writes about in his work, that we need trauma-informed care at all levels of society, where we really think about the human self as like our history, what happened to us, how our brain works the way it does, you know, just each unique personal history and how it connects to our family lineage and our community presence. So what would that look like? I mean, one memory comes to mind right away when I was a hospital chaplain at a hospital in New Jersey and a woman who was just a few years older than me, maybe in her 50s, 40s, 50s, was with her dad who was dying. And he was a big man with a big barrel chest, a wide face, big hands, just this big father, just this loving big father. She loved him so much. At one point, she just crawled into the hospital bed with him and held him and cried and held him through his dying hours. And so we think of hospitals as pretty limited in their capacity to hold space maybe for a family. But that type of action, you know, crawling into bed next to someone who's dying that you love and holding them close, that's the type of thing that often people associate with dying at home. And yet here it was happening there. And so how do we create models where we, we aren't either or, where we can say, you know, when people die in our hospital, we do our best to welcome family, community, touch. We welcome you to, you know, be close as you feel comfortable. And, you know, as long as the dying person feels comfortable exhibiting signs of comfort, that there is a welcoming of that kind of touch. So that's one example that comes to mind. But I do think bringing in the best thinkers of these different systems that we have that all interrelate and really think, well, how do we take the best of these various models and have a both and or dialectical approach? I mean, that's what I'm trying to do at the Institute with certain classes, really trying to take some real key thinkers and have them speak to doulas about their work so that we have a trauma-informed you know, anti-racism approach to our work that it also includes self-care. So I hope that answers your question some, you know, those are the thoughts that came to mind as I was listening to your thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I am interested just to hear any of your thoughts on these questions and try to visualize. Because I think sometimes when we've been raised and conditioned and don't have examples of what it could look like to cross these portals with our loved ones in a good way. Sometimes maybe for some of us, we can't even imagine what that would look like. I remember the first time I had been with a past body, I was so afraid to touch the body. And my mom went up and touched the body of this this being who had passed. And just seeing her touch this being was an opening for me. And it was shocking. And I was so scared and I was so sad. And then I went up and I touch this being. And I ended up being with this body for two or three days before they went into the ground. And just her opening that, it was like opening an availability that I hadn't even known was possible because I had never been in that experience. So I think for so many of us, whether it's through the birth or death process, we don't have the teachings or we haven't been taught or learned through experience or otherwise what to do with ourselves, our emotions, our bodies, how to be with the other person. Like what you said, even about feeling comfortable being touched or touching, showing emotion, whether that's joy or laughter or grief. I mean, there's just so much that comes up in these moments. They're 
probably the most powerful moments of our lives. And so I just like hearing stories from you. I think it's really helpful to be able to see ourselves potentially in these situations and visualize a bit. I really resonate with that. I think the modeling of storytelling is the ancient way we used to and still teach each other. When we go back before written language, you know, written language developed about 6,000 years ago. We have evidence human beings, as we know ourselves to be, have been on this planet about 40,000 years, if I'm getting that right. And before then, of course, we have all the different forms of hominids and Neanderthal. And, and this is from one perspective, right? What we know of looking at anthropology and archaeology. So if it's true that most of our human history, 34,000 years, preceded written language or the evidence of that we can find, that means people told stories long ago too, long, long ago, around fires and homes, as they walked, as they hunted, as they breastfed, as they cared, as they birthed, as they died. And so it's through the storytelling in a multi-generational context where you don't have all the kids in one building and all the old people in another building. I mean, I think that divide is so sad for our culture where we have separated ourselves from the elders and the young. So that that multi-dimensional community, multi-age generational community is full of story. And some of them are very sad and some of them are very beautiful. And those stories do open possibility, whether they're mythic stories around religion or mystery or their family history stories. So I really agree. It's through this telling of stories that possibilities do open. And I mean, I think about the type of rituals I've seen done around pregnancy loss. You know, the different tattoos, the different rituals around blood, the different burial rituals, the different altars in people's homes to honor babies that have died. And if we could just have those stories, it would seem like, oh, there's, we're not just alone in this vacuum of grief. You know, thousands, millions of people have made stories and told stories and made ritual to honor babies who have died. And so these stories should be known. Right, I think it helps us process. It helps us feel like we're part of the human story, that this isn't only an experience that I am suffering. I mean, a big part of the Institute work is looking at these portals, these threshold points through the lens of companioning. How do we companion the support network? Who's with us? Who's companioning us? Right. So how do we companion ourselves? How do we receive companioning, which is an approach to bereavement care or transition care that normalizes the emotions instead of makes grief a pathology. And then the third piece is ritual. What types of ritual, secular or religious, do we use to honor these threshold moments? So at the Institute, we have a class called Rituals for Menopause. And there's very few rituals for menopause in our world today. Yet it's a big transition. I'm going through it. Having a gathering of, you know, 50 women online talking about menopause, reading stories, normalizing experiences, crying, laughing, sharing, and then creating a group ritual where we, we might move, we might breathe, we might paint, we might light a candle. And it's open to so many faiths because it's crafted by the group, drawing elements from the earth, from our history, pictures of our ancestors, honoring what it's like to enter into this stage of life where, you know, periods have stopped. And yet there's so much ahead where we can nourish our community and family. Okay, so you got me onto that topic of ritual. And that, I think, is key to really reflecting on how we bring more intentionality to thresholds. So, yeah, thank you for highlighting stories. Because it's hard to have a meaningful ritual without a story. Right? Why are we lighting the candle? Whose picture is that on the altar? Why are we doing this long pilgrimage? What are the stories of those who've done this ritual before? I mean, just think of Passover or Pesach, if you're Jewish, that ritual of that meal, the Seder, and the thousands and thousands of Jews or millions of Jews who celebrate that every spring and, and the history of that meal. Every part of that meal, every portion of the plate has a significance to the story in Exodus. So it's an incredible ritual to study. And I think we need more of those, honestly. And we can make our own. We can definitely make our own personal rituals that help us with our own life story. You know, so if you're listening to this and you've lived through something really hard, it doesn't have to just sit in a dark corner of your mind. It can become a powerful force for 
insight and change. They can make a ritual to honor that you survived this, that you moved through, that you've gained self-awareness. You can mark your body with something with this or have a place in your home or a part of your journal where you honor those hard edges. And that's a lot of shadow work right there. And there's courses in the Institute on shadow work because if doulas do their shadow work, they'll be more effective as doulas. We can hold more space because we've digested more of our own story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can absolutely see that. And I think that, of course, doulas doing their own shadow work is important, as is all of us, and show up and be better companions to each other in these moments. And, And maybe that's the question right now for me is, how do we, you know, us non doulas, how do we show up better in these moments for the other, but also for ourselves? Because I think that these moments are so transformative for everybody involved. And I'd love to know how we can show up as better companions, those of us who are maybe leaders of the moments. Yeah, that's a great question. For me, the strengthening of those skills is a lifelong journey. I think of Thich Nhat Hanh, the late Buddhist teacher, who would say when you point your finger to the moon, you're pointing your finger to the moon, but you're not actually touching the moon, right? You're moving in the direction, but it's not like a, a perfect grasp. In the same way you look at a menu, you read the word pizza, you order pizza. The menu points to pizza, but it's not as if the menu is pizza. The moon isn't your finger. You're, you're pointing to an ideal that you're pointing to companioning. And I think everyone does it imperfectly. I certainly do. And yet we can strengthen our power to honor our imperfection and show up with more intentionality, to show up with more compassion and presence. And in that sense, we become perfectly imperfect. (laughs) But I don't know anyone who holds space perfectly. But I do know many people who strive to strengthen the power to hold space for imperfection. And in that, I think we can hold the messiness of our own lives with compassion. We certainly can more effectively hold the messiness of transition moments with more compassion. The threshold moments are messy. They're often challenging. Sometimes they're super insightful and clear, but usually threshold moments involve a transformation that can be mysterious, like a caterpillar goes into the chrysalis and then emerges a butterfly. That chrysalis stage is really interesting. It's like, it's not quite a caterpillar. It's not quite a butterfly. Everything is moving around. You need your privacy. You need the quiet. There's lots of change. And, and many of us go through those moments, those chrysalis moments in life. And having a companion to just be present, to say, I see you. It may be messy now. I see your beauty. And I know you will emerge transformed. Thinking about your work with the breath element moments, and I'm wondering how do you find connection to the breath that holds us between life and death? And how do you recognize the immense value and power of this seemingly mundane act, which is breathing? And of course, we do it all the time unconsciously, but Maybe you could walk us through that practice. Sure. So if you're driving, don't do this. <laughs> you, can, you can be aware of breath, but do not close your eyes, please. But if you are in a place where you can sit and notice or lay down and notice the safety around you to close your eyes and that feels safe to do, I invite you to try that and just close your eyes. And the reason we do that it's because so much of our sensory input comes through vision for those of us who do see with eyes. Sometimes we see in other ways. But once the eyes are closed, the other senses, sound, touch, taste, physical sensation, breath, become more present. So right now, pay attention to 
the act of breathing. Breathe in. Just breathe in. And breathe out. And you can do that with a, you know, out the mouth as a bit of a wind for yourself or simply quietly through the nose. Again, just breathe in. And breathe out. And let's practice a simple breath technique called four, seven, eight. So when you breathe in with me, I will count to four, all right? And you breathe in the whole time. And then hold that breath in and I'll count to seven. And then when you exhale, see if you can let that exhale out slowly so it goes all the way to eight and I'll count to eight. We'll do it twice. I teach this breath to my fifth and sixth graders, four, seven, eight. And it helps the nervous system go back into the zone of tolerance and out of fight flight. So let's try that together. So breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And try it on your own. Just settle, keeping your awareness internal for now, in that chrysalis space. This is a threshold. Meditation itself, resting, breathing, slowing down, entering into mystery. Just be with this. when you're ready. You slowly open the eyes if you've closed them. Just notice how that feels. How your shoulders might feel, your toes, maybe wiggle your toes. Notice your jaw muscles, your teeth, your tongue. Maybe one more time before you sleep today. Stop and pause and feel the breath. And sometimes that breath awareness is really involved. I mean, we're really aware of it when we're really involved in action. So think of running a marathon or dancing, playing music, singing. There's so much breath. And that can be a real meditation in action. So it's not as if you have to just get quiet. Sometimes deep action can help us be aware of breath too. And eventually it's when you do your dishes or type your emails, just noticing the breath, pausing for a moment, roll the shoulders, you know, put the phone down, hold someone's hand that you love. Just take a breath together. This precious life that goes so fast. So thank you for letting me lead through a simple meditation. Yeah, it was lovely. I really appreciated it. It made me feel really good and I just relaxed and got quieter. I definitely felt my nervous system relax. It was really lovely. Thank you. I should do that every day. (laughs) It's a good reminder. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, that's what Dr. Bruce Perry says. We we don't need just, you know, one hour of therapy in the week. We really need therapeutic moments there's just can be short and sweet woven into our days from many people you know that community that multi-generational community having therapeutic moments he calls it where we have rhythm where we have a sense of connection where we have a sense of meaning where we're eating healthy food and taking care of the body that's how trauma is healed in the nervous system over time overall you know these really organic therapeutic moments I think we can craft them too, you know, like right now I purposely crafted that and yet it it can become what's woven into our days should we choose to do it. Mm -hmm. That's such a 
such an important, simple act to remember. And I, I like that little therapeutic moments. It feels less overwhelming and doable. And I think the more that we practice, the more that it becomes integrated into our day to day lives. And that feels really important. And I want to jump into this other topic that has always felt very strange to me, which is the taboos around birth and really the site of birth, which is considered inappropriate. Even let's say on social media, like photos of birth will be banned, which is really interesting to me because it's almost compared to pornography, which again is really strange. And I think it's just absurd that we live in a society that simultaneously (laughs) glamorizes and commodifies the human body. And then it censors depictions of birth itself. It's really, it's just odd. I'm trying to get to the bottom of this. And so I'm wondering how might we heal our connections to our bodies as a culture in a way that does allow us to embrace their natural functions outside of the glamorized and unrealistic options that we're given, whether that's through pornography or honestly just advertisements or media in general? Uh, I think, I mean, two two things come to mind. I, I think of an article I wrote years ago called Birth is Not Porn. <laughs> so this is a topic I've thought about as well and reflected on. And in that same type of hypersexualization of the female body in particular impacts how women and those who identify as women choose to breastfeed in public, right? Just what does that mean to to breastfeed a child in public, especially if the child's older, you know, a toddler, two, three, or four, there's a huge taboo. And yet so much of pornography grows due to, um, in some sense, violent taboo, right? And pushing the edge with depictions of rape and things that are uh, illegal, you know? So I think it's a wild juxtaposition. I'm with you there. I don't have an answer. I can just point you to people I like who are asking these questions. You know, Gail Dines has done a lot around pornography and reflections on it. Jackson Katz who wrote a wonderful book called The Macho Paradox, and he has a whole chapter on what pornography has meant to men and boys growing up. I think there's a lot to explore. And again, the dialectic is what I like. So on one end, you might have anti-body or anti-porn or anti-sex energies. On the other hand, you might have a really liberal, like, let's show everything approach. And I I think there's wisdom in the wise mind that can stand in the middle ground where we really think through well, what, what helps the human self feel and know their worth, number one, and the multidimensional reality of their life. So we're not only bodies, we also have minds and hearts and, and we treat each other with that. And that birth is how we come here, right? And the people who birth us so much respect. So those pictures are, I think, holy rather than censored. So I think you're asking the right questions and you're asking the person who also asked these questions. I don't have answers. I think about this too. Mm -hmm. I just think it impacts the way we relate to birth. And even, you know, on the flip side to a dying body or a sick body or a body that has passed, our culture oftentimes teaches us that it's gross or scary. And so it's interesting, you know, birth can be pornographic and death can be gross or frightening. And I mean, in a way I can understand the fear. I think we at large have a fear of our own mortality, but I think it really blocks our connection to these beautiful and powerful threshold moments if we are relating them to them being inappropriate or, you know, something that we should keep distance of. So anyways, yeah, such a big topic and not that I have answers either, but I appreciate hearing your thoughts. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for being brave to ask it. Yeah, it's on my mind too. It's it, it makes me wonder why, you know, what is it for the overculture? Where did this come from? Did it have a religious beginning? Is it puritanical? Is it for control? <laughs> like, why, why are we set up to feel these ways? I don't know if you've thought about the roots of this at all. Well, probably connects to, I mean, my best guess, and this is just my my best guess right now, based on what I've read, 
But, you know, when a woman gives birth, there's no question that that child is hers. We, we see it emerge. We see it. But the father may question, is, was it mine? Are you sure? Because there's no direct evidence unless there's some like really compelling identifying feature like skin color or like physical feature perhaps. So I think perhaps it has to do with patrilineal systems where power and money pass through the father and son and you really want to make sure it's your son biologically. So then it means you got to control female reproduction and women need to be contained. Their sexuality must be contained so that you know for sure that this is your progeny. I mean, this is just one theory, but it still begs the question why patri patrilineal systems of descending powers. So I'm with you. I don't know the answer, but I do think it's a good question. And, and I think our society benefits from having really heartfelt, honest reflection on these topics so we can hear different views and consider each other's wisdom. I think it's so important. I'd like to transition and talk a bit about the shadow side of caregiving. And you're teaching a course called Hungry Ghost, examining the shadow side of caregiving and describing an aspect of the course. You write, quote, how can we bring compassionate presence to the parts of us that we have discarded, ignored, or tried to self-medicate through maladaptive soothing mechanisms? As we learn to hold space for our hungry ghosts, we also learn to hold space and respond appropriately to the hungry ghosts of those around us, end quote. How must caregivers be aware of what they bring to the table and interaction with those they care for? And maybe how can we create supportive spaces for caregivers that allow for better quality of care all around? Yeah, this is a really important topic for so many. I've seen a lot of people, you know, have compassion fatigue or find themselves exhausted from their caregiving. And it might not be doula work, formal birth or death work. It could be mothering. It could be in a relationship, a partnership where you do a lot of caregiving or tending to the needs of another at the expense of one's own. And so I've spent a lot of hours reflecting on this, talking with people, reading about dynamics where the shadow side of caregiving becomes really problematic. And part of that connects to codependency, where we have patterns where we might want to control other people so we feel regulated, right? As long as he's happy or she's happy, then I'm happy. And so it's a lot about controlling someone else's nervous system instead of our own. And so I think caregiving has to do with boundaries. It has to do, yes, with service and yes, with you know, stretching the self. And those of us who grew up Christian, I grew up Christian, was such an emphasis on being Christ-like, you know, always patient, turn the other cheek, give your coat to your neighbor, Someone condemns you, you know, seven times, you know, just forgive seven times more. So there's this real sense of like, I'm expansive. I can hold a lot of space for someone's shadow. I, I forgive. I am patient. And then that can set us up for relationship dynamics where we become depleted or used and abused and they're unfulfilling relationships. And those relationships could be work or a personal or even a, a doula relationship where a mom might be really needy and the doula just keeps giving, giving, giving at the expense. So I think if I'm going to craft an institute where doulas and people who are drawn to thresholds come for personal and professional growth, it would be remiss to not have a course that deals with the shadow side of this work. And so even as a teacher, the shadow side of teaching involves, you know, overgiving, overextending, and not having our own boundaries. I think it's so important to have healthy boundaries. And so this course is to help strengthen all of us. And just like with holding space, I don't know anyone who does it perfectly. Just like with parenting, I don't know any perfect parent. In the same way, I don't know any perfect caregiver. I don't think there is such a thing. 
but there are people who are healthier than others in terms of their patterns. So this is a course to try to support all of us in becoming healthier with our patterns of caregiving for self and others and having boundaries. And, and the big part of this course too is recognizing red flags when people are toxic or malignant or like super self-centered and well, probably best not to be in a deep relationship with patterns like that because it will deplete and to be able to recognize it and then not engage, you know, having respectful boundaries, but protecting oneself from exploitation. I'm really grateful that you, that you offer these courses and this support because we need it. <laughs> we really need it. I wanted to read a quote from an article you wrote called Holding Space for Pregnancy Loss, Three Components for Doulas to Consider, where you say, quote, anyone who has been touched by death knows there's no returning to a previous life. We are irrevocably changed due to the loss of loved ones, particularly the death of our children. The companioning approach to understanding and being with grief acknowledges this reality, end quote. And I often see there's this force to, quote, get back to normal after grieving, as if it's a box to be checked or just something to escape from. How do you think holding space for grief also means holding space for grief and sadness to change us? You know, I have tears in my eyes. I listen to you. I mean, everything changes us. The water we drink every day, the way we sleep at night, what we eat changes us. The changes are so sometimes small that we assume we're the same every moment. But if we look deeply in each moment, the moment is different. Like right now, when I stop this interview, I'm changed from you. Your questions, your reflections, your wisdom, it changes me. So we're changing all the time. I believe there's a part of us that doesn't change. That's my spiritual belief. Not everyone shares that. That's fine. But my mind is always changing, my heart, my body, every cell, every moment, every breath. And grief is an upheaval. It's an upheaval. Everything looks upside down. It brings us to our knees. We feel like life's an emergency. Someone we love just died. There's moments of clarity and gratitude and grace. There's moments of confusion and anger and denial. It's an upheaval. How could it not change us if every text message we send and receive changes us? So does grief. So the normal is the sense that, well, there's equilibrium, that the change is imperceptible. I wake up every day, I'm a day older, but I don't look that different in the mirror. But if I look at myself at 49 now and look at pictures of myself at 19, uh, 30 years, I'm like, wow, I see the change. And in 30 more years, I'll look back at 49 and think, oh, I was so young. <laughs> so, you know, things change. And when we have gaps, the big change, we see it. And so grief is a big change. It changes us. And sometimes it's really, really private. People may not even talk about the abortion they had, may not ever be known, but it's a change. And it's a, a type of birth and death and loss where they don't talk about they were sexually abused as a kid. It's no one may ever know. They may die and no one may never know. But it changes us, the grief that is unexpressed too. So to return to normal, I think when people in good faith say, I, I'd like to return to normal or go back to what, what it was, it's just a real hunger for equilibrium again. It's hard to be in the threshold for a long, long time. And I think that hunger can be honored. I can say, yeah, I get that. You want to return to this innocence or return to what was. I think that's part of grief is to long for the time before grief because it's really an upheaval. All the people in Ukraine who are fleeing or moving around or having their neighborhoods bombed, I bet they really do long. I would long. Gosh, you know, before this war, two years ago, before this war, before my neighbor died or my son died or my uncle died. So grief does change, but everything also changes. It's just a big, significant change. It's like 30 years all at once. It's like you see it so big. And I think there's wisdom in grief. I think there's wisdom to be found, a post-traumatic wisdom, we could say. Dr. Joanne Cacciatore, one of my favorite writers of grief in her a mom of five, I mean, one of her babies died really young, and she named this little one Cheyenne. And it's been like 20 years. She still writes about Cheyenne. And she's learned so much because Cheyenne died. You know, she's learned so much. But in one point in her book, 
bearing the unbearable, she writes, I would give up all of that wisdom to have her back. So I think that's what grief is, is honoring the wisdom we gain, but the longing still for what was before. Sometimes that, I mean, 20 years, and she's this professor on you know, grief studies, but she says, I'll give all this up to have her back. Hmm. Oh, Amy, thank you for sharing that. It feels so close to my heart and vulnerable and really felt connected in this conversation. And I just think us talking about grief is so important. And I think so many of us have been so destigmatized to grief and loss because, well, for so many reasons, but, you know, I think about the media and we're just literally bombarded with violence and death and we become desensitized to it. And so it, it makes sense too that that plays into our block from being able to hold the sacredness of death and hold space for grief because we're desensitized in the strangest ways to loss and grief and violence and death. And it's just, yeah, it's like a, a rabbit hole of confusion in there. And the other reflection I was sitting with too is from a few moments ago when you spoke about leaning on ritual and tradition in the threshold times of uncertainty, because it is uncertain how we move forward. And it's uncertain even how we navigate the present moment with so much conditioning that has really taken us away from feeling secure as we move through life. So I just really appreciate you sitting in the complexity of these topics and would love to just hear whatever is on your mind as we close. Well, think about if I had a glass of water and I took a spoon and started spinning, the water moves, right? It's laws of physics. It spins, it spins, it spins. And then I pull the spoon out real quick. It's not as if the water gets still right away. It spins still until it slows. And the slowing takes time and it takes time until the motion settles. And even when a glass of water is quote, still, there's a lot of movement that we may not see with our physical eyes, but the molecules are shifting and H2O is forming, you know, moving. It's not static. So I think part of what I reflect on when I heard you describe the uncertainty, the sense of desensitized human beings feeling unsafe, but then consuming so much imagery of violence. It's, you know, it's a lot to consider. It's like a spoon in the water, spin, spin, spin. Maybe there's some kind of joy in the spin, but, it, you know, we pull out the spoon and it's going to take a while for our nervous systems to settle again and find those quiet moments in the day when the water stills and it feels soft. So my suggestion to all who are listening is we just nourish that softness. We live in a world with a lot of hard edges and sometimes things happen in life that you wouldn't expect. It's a big hard edge. You know, someone you love dies or there's some kind of harsh thing that happens in your story and you think, oh my God, I didn't see that coming. So even more important in those moments to make sure we nourish the softness and find our companions who can walk with us through the wilderness and and nourish the the love, I think, that really gives life meaning. I mean, grief is connected to love and they're always connected, actually. We, if people died and we didn't care, they'd just die. They'd just be death. It wouldn't be grief. And that may be explaining why we can watch movies. We don't really care about those characters. They're just, we know they're going to die, especially with horror movies. They're all going to die. So it's kind of like playing into our fear or that trying to digest our own sense of interest in seeing the shadow. It's not really a place for grief. It's a place for something else, like exploring human violence. But when we really love someone and death happens, there's grief. And so I would say we nourish love, we nourish softness, and we nourish our capacity to be in grief. We will become wiser. <laughs> That's my sense. We will become wiser. So thank you for your time. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with me. Thank you, Amy. Have a beautiful day. Thanks for listening to For the Wild. The music you heard today is by Lark Hall, Amber Rubarth, and Rosie Boyd. For the Wild is created by Ayana Young, Erica Ekram, Julia Jackson, Jackson Krupp, and Evan Tenenbaum. <laughs>